Yeah, let's get started. So welcome everyone to the fifth Visible User Meeting and my opening talk to uh, give an overview of what we did with EasyBuild in 2009 and also a little bit where we're going in the coming year. Um, so we've had four EasyBuild User Meetings before. We forgot to take pictures at the first two. We only have 2018, 2019. Um, but in terms of attendance, um, it's growing significantly. It says 53 here for today, here in Barcelona. There's actually a couple of people who forgot to register or people who joined very late, so it's actually more than 53. Um, there's a big mix of people from all over Europe, lots of local attendance, of course, from Spain and HPC Now, but also two people flying in from the US, somebody from Cyprus, um, and also other non-European countries like the UK, so it's very nice to have this good mix of people here. 13 different countries, not including HPC now, which is not a country yet, uh, in three different continents, so that's very cool. In terms of agenda for, for this week, in terms of agenda for this week, so I'll start with an overview of uh, Easy build in the last year and where we're going. Um, then John, who flew in from Seattle all the way here from Fred Hutch, um, will give an overview of how Easy build is used at Fred Hutch and also give some updates on the Easy Update tool that he wrote, uh, which is very helpful and maybe where we can go with that in the future. Um, Shazeb, ah, there's a typo there on the slide, sorry. Um, Shazep will talk about building an easy build container library um, in the Scilabs cloud. So some ideas there, how that can be done. Then we'll have a remote talk by Maxime, who will be calling in from um, Canada and talking about how they are using easy build and some other tools combined to build a big software stack for the HPC sites in Canada, how they're sharing that and how all that works. And then Massimiliano um, really wanted to join the EasyBuild user meeting again after last year and give us an update on SPAC as well. Um, then tonight we'll do a group dinner in one of the best tapas bars in Barcelona. We have to check with David how things are going to work practically. So we're, we'll go there by group. Everyone who wants to join can join, but uh, it's at their own cost uh, tonight. So definitely let it know on the, at the registration. And I think we have to set up some um, upfront payment as well for that. But more on that later. And then tomorrow we have a busy agenda. Giuseppe will be talking about his build test tool. Um, Fazelius from CSCS will be talking about reframe. Then we'll have several side presentations. So the people, Oriel from HPC Now, um, will talk about how HPC Now is using EasyBuild in their consultancy work. Um, Simon from Birmingham. Uh, we'll talk about the use of EasyBuild at the University of Birmingham and OK about the about Umea and maybe Sweden uh, as well. Then Umit will talk about their uh, HPC on OpenStack setup that they have at the Vienna Biocenter. Bio um, then a little bit more side presentations. Luca from CSCS and Kaspar from Surfsara in the Netherlands. And then in the afternoon, Sam is going to give um, a small tutorial on how you can contribute back to EasyBuild. So Sam is one of the EasyBuild maintainers attending the meeting this week. And you'll see the EasyBuild maintainers have a red name tag. So if you have any burning questions on EasyBuild and you bump into somebody with a, with a red name tag, you can definitely ask them. Um, and they can hopefully help you out. And then to close up, uh, the talks on Thursday will have another remote talk by Robert McClay, who will be calling in from Austin um, and give an update on Elmot and Exalt. And then, of course, since we're in Spain, we have to wrap up the day in a nice restaurant. So we'll go to a very nice place, Can Cortada. And the best news here is this will be sponsored by HPC again, so you won't have to pay for all the good food you get there. Then on Friday morning, uh, we will start very early, um, so there's a tour, an organized uh, or a guided tour at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center on Friday morning. 
Um, it was very difficult to find a slot for a group as big as this. Um, so the people from HPC Now did a very good job at finding a slot. The downside is it's quite early in the day. So the, there will be a bus leaving at the Ibis Hotel where lots of the people attending here are staying. And the bus will come here, right in front of the technological park here, and leave at quarter to eight. The tour will start half past eight, and then we should be back here by around 10 for the coffee break. Um, so there will be lots of coffee. Um, so you can wake up for the rest of the talks on Friday, where Luca from CSCS will be talking about the Saros container um, runtime they have at CSCS. And then two more side presentations by Yin Zhang, who flew in all the way from Australia to Barcelona for this meeting. And Alexander um, from the University of Dresden in Germany. Um, and then I'll close up with a more informal talk, maybe 10 things you didn't know yet about EasyBuild. I haven't finished my slides yet for that, so if you have any tips, let me know. So as, as you've noticed, we've been setting up a live stream um, so people can also join the meeting remotely and ask questions via Slack and all of that. And we have a pretty good track record of um, recording all the talks we've had up until now at the EasyBuild user meetings. And all of them are posted on the EasyBuild YouTube channel, which we have since last year as well. So thanks a lot to Alan for all the effort in setting all that up. So before we dive into EasyBuild itself, a little bit about me. Um, you can find me on GitHub, Slack, Twitter. Um, I lose a lot of time uh, on Twitter. Maybe I shouldn't. Um, I got my uh, computer science degree at Ghent University in Belgium. I, I was working with machine learning before it was cool. Um, so in the 2005 uh, era. And then when I started, the, when I joined the HPC team in Ghent in October 2010, I quickly was assigned to user support and training. A big part of that is so doing software installations for the, for the scientists. And EasyBuild was already there at that time in the team, but it was shoved into my lab. And then uh, we took it a step further by releasing it public, and things exploded from there. Um, I like a lot of things, including beer. So if you want to buy me a beer, I will not stop you. <coughs> um, if you have some nice stickers, I can probably pull off another one and put the sticker on my laptop. There's also lots of things I don't like, um, which are mostly a result of using EasyBuild or implementing EasyBuild. Um, the HPC team in Ghent University um, is a central team at the IT department of the university. So we help pretty much anyone at the university who wants to use our HPC infrastructure. We do training, support. Um, we mostly just buy the hardware and install and configure everything ourselves. Um, we have a modest infrastructure. It's not terribly big, but it's big enough um, that we need to have a lot of work and we need a lot of manpower to keep it running. And we're also a member of the Flemish <coughs> Supercomputer Center, which is a collaboration between the Flemish universities. So we share accounts, we get access to each other's infrastructure and so on. Um, in preparation for the meeting this week, we did a user survey. This is the third time we've organized this. Um, it's an anonymous survey through SurveyMonkey, which is a very good tool for um, organizing surveys. We basically do it to get more insight into the EasyBuild community, get some feedback as well in an anonymous way so people don't have to be scared. Um, <coughs> or shy to say that things are broken or that they are not happy with certain aspects. It's a pretty long survey, 39 questions, but a lot of people were participating in it. So we had 91 this year, which is pretty good. Um, and the assumption here is that it gives a pretty good view on, uh, on the community. But yeah, we don't really make any big decisions based solely, solely on, the, on the survey, of course. And I'll go through the, re the results of the survey in this presentation mixed with uh, some other things. So first couple of questions in the survey were, um, what kind of profile do you have? What do you consider yourself to be? Um, so over half of the people consider themselves to be a sysadmin, and then another quarter to do user support. And then go, it, you have a bit of a splintered view for the rest of it. So there's a clear bias 
in the EasyBuild community towards user support and system administration, which is not a, a big surprise. In terms of type of organizations, it's a big mix. Um, central um, computing centers at universities or maybe research groups, national computing centers, public and private research institutes, some companies, and so on. Uh, most of the EasyBuild community seems to be in Europe, which is not a surprise either. Uh, but we do get a, a bit of coverage in, in North America, the US as well. Um, and then small bits and pieces throughout the rest of the world, Australia, Asia, Africa. So all of this is, we, we don't see any big shifts here compared to previous years. Um, how long have you been using EasyBuild was a, another question we asked. So here we do see a bit of a shift um, to people who have been using EasyBuild for a long time, either longer than five years or two to five years. Uh, I'm not sure how to interpret this, but it seems like people that start using EasyBuild stick to it. Otherwise, they, we wouldn't have a, a big ratio like this. But we do see, see, still see new people coming in as well. So that's, uh, that's good, I guess. Um, how did people first learn about EasyBuild? Most of this is basically word, word of mouth, presentations, articles, people showing it, or uh, people trying to convince someone else to, this is a good tool, you should try and use it. So that's, uh, that's the best. Um, advertisement you can get, I guess. Um, we do see a big increase of people saying it's already in use. So people who changed jobs, um, EasyBuild was already being used at that site and they rolled into uh, the tool that way. And then the most convincing part about EasyBuild, why people pick up on it, is basically the core functionality. So the EasyBuild framework, what it can do, generate modules, automate software installations, uh, fully, auto fully autonomously and so on, and also uh, a bit of the supported software so people run into things like OpenFoam or TensorFlow that they want to install from source, and if you do it manually, um, you'll get depressed pretty quickly. So that's how people find um, EasyBuild, and of course, the already in use is a big part here as well. So some of the highlights of last year. So when we had the user meeting um, last year, we, I talked a little bit about EasyBuild 4, what was coming up. Um, so we finally got EasyBuild 4 out the door last September. That was a big relief. I was very happy that we finally made that release because we were working on EasyBuild 4 and EasyBuild 3 updates in parallel, which was a lot of work and a lot of um, shifting attention between the two and making sure the separate branch we had for EasyBuild 4 did not get out of date compared to EasyBuild 3, so that was a bit of a, a bit of a hassle. But now the release is there, we're back to a single branch where all development is being done. Um, the community keeps growing, and I'll show some st some stats on that. We see also see significant growth in contributions, which is very good, and we're still managing to keep up with the incoming contributions, which is very important as well. So if you get thousand pull requests but you can only merge 200 then you're very overwhelmed so if I think we've done a pretty good job keeping up with contributions um, even though we see a significant growth there uh, we have over 12 percent increase in supported software packages which doesn't seem like a lot but we're close to 2,000 supported software packages now so that's a, a significant growth and um, I should also mention there that we archived a lot of old easy configs, so we actually lost support for some software packages which are no longer relevant or no longer updated or nobody is interested in them anymore. And we archived those easy configs in easy build 4. So we, we got a little bit of a dip there, um, but we still have a, an increase compared to the beginning of last year. We have significantly better support for installing Python packages and bundles of Python packages now, even you can do a single installation that's compatible with both Python 2 and Python 3, so we have a good way of dealing with that. Um, we do a better job at checking the installation, so we've discovered this pip check command uh, that makes sure that all the dependencies that the Python package requires are actually there. <coughs> we were not doing that before, and we, we ended up with half-broken installations in, in some 
cases. So we, we do a pretty good job now at avoiding those. Um, we jumped on the GitHub Actions bandwagon. So GitHub now has a native um, continuous integration system or service, I should say, inside of GitHub. So everything is in GitHub. You don't really need a separate service like Travis anymore. Um, so we were using Travis before. We're still using Travis. We're basically now using both Travis and GitHub Actions for now. Well, the long-term plan is to shift everything to, to GitHub Actions because it's native in GitHub. Um, it provides a lot more resources. You can run more tests in parallel so you get quicker feedback on pull requests. And overall, it's a lot more stable in Travis's. For now, I, I want to say we're not confident enough yet to drop Travis entirely. Um, and it's also not very easy to test easy build on top of Python 2.6 in GitHub Actions, which is now very, very old, but we still support it, which is in Travis is very easy. So we'll certainly keep Travis for that part um, for the coming months, and we'll see how that evolves in the future. Uh, the GitHub integration that we have in EasyBuild was significantly, significantly improved, and Sam will talk about that tomorrow in the tutorial. And also the support for building Singularity container images was, was um, improved quite a bit in the first half of 2019. And that's probably going to come forward in Chiseb's talk um, this afternoon as well. So the most important changes in EasyBuild 4, um, well, this flagship change or the biggest feature is the, the fact that EasyBuild now works on top of Python 3 as well. So any version um, newer than or equal than 3. Python 3.5 should work now, and we still support Python 2.6 and 2.7 as well. Um, we've dropped some required dependencies. So the Python, uh, the setup tools Python package was required by EasyBuild at runtime because of some technical internal details, and we had this VSC base library, which is a, a, a Python library that we've developed inside of HPC Ugent, which has the option parser and the logging um, support and so on. So this was a required dependency in EasyBuild 3. We've dropped these as dependencies. We basically ingested VSC base into EasyBuild itself because this was not ported yet to Python 3. It still isn't actually. So the move to ingest it and do the porting inside of EasyBuild itself um, was a first step to support <coughs> Python 3. Um, and it also simplifies the installation of EasyBuild itself a bit. Sometimes we, we ran into problems because of breaking changes in setup tools, which don't make any sense at all to me, or people having a very old setup tools <coughs> installation on their system and then running into problems because of that. It's not very easy to update setup tools in some cases. So just got rid of all of that, and you don't need these packages anymore. You just need EasyBuild itself and the Python standard library, and that's it. Um, we've deprecated the dummy tool chain for two reasons. It had some quirky behavior in terms of when dependencies are loaded. So we got rid of that and the name was a bit silly as well. So we renamed it to the system tool chain, which probably makes more sense. Um, you can still use dummy now in easy config files, but you'll get a warning that it's deprecated. It still does the same thing it, do it did before. It's just an alias now for the system tool chain. So it's not a big issue if you're still using it, but you should try not to. And then another change that we did quite late um, in preparation for EasyBuild 4 is that EasyBuild will now detect unknown EasyConfig parameters, so keys that you use in EasyConfig files that are not known to EasyBuild, um, which could be typos or could be just mistakes, something that you think is supported in an EasyConfig file but is actually not. So it will now print out a warning if it sees anything it doesn't know. And together with that, we had to implement a naming scheme for local variables. So sometimes you do use variables in an easy config file that are not easy config parameters. And if you prefix them with local underscore or just underscore, EasyBuild will not complain about those. So, um, and all of this, all of these changes are well documented in a separate um, page in the documentation, which is linked from the main page. <clears throat> and a bit more on the road to Python 3, so it, it took us a while to port EasyBuild to Python 3, um, mostly because we don't have a lot of time to dedicate, or I don't have a lot of time to, de to dedicate to EasyBuild development. 
and also because we didn't want the porting to Python 3 to disrupt the Easy Build 3 version, so we kept doing Easy Build 3 releases and bug fixes and improvements there, and we did the porting on the side, so it was a bit of a, a duplicate effort. So the I started the effort in December 2018, so before the previous user meeting. Um, we ingested VSC base first, because that wasn't ported yet to Python 3, so we just copied everything we needed into EasyBuild itself <laughs> and then ported it there, um, because the impact of porting VSC base is a lot bigger inside of HPC or Gantt. Um, we had to be very careful there. Then we made sure that all the unit tests for the EasyBuild framework were passing on top of Python 3.6, which, which was our main um, goal at first. So it took us about, or it took me mostly about a month or two um, to get that working. Then we also uh, made some additional changes to also support Python 3.5 and 3.7. So one of the issues with Python 3 now is that pretty much every 3.x release has some breaking changes it seems like they're somehow scared to release Python 4 for some reason. Um, so I guess the whole mess with Python 2 and Python 3, and it took forever for people to pick up on Python 3. I think there will never be a Python 4. They will just keep breaking Python 3 over and over again. Um, once that was done, by mid-March, we started doing actual testing of EasyBuild itself, installing software <laughs> with EasyBuild running on top of Python 3 and then discovering some bugs there in EasyBlocks but also in Framework. And we fixed those over the course of a couple of months. And then finally we had an EasyBuild 4 release that supported Python 3 in September 2019. Then when people started using EasyBuild on top of Python 3, a couple of more small bugs popped up and those were fixed in the weeks and months after. And then with the 411 release, which was done earlier this month, there are no known issues on top of Python 3 anymore. So it's pretty stable when you want to use EasyBuild on top of Python 3. Some may still pop up. We'll see. Certainly if people start using Python 3 more um, for EasyBuild, but I'm fairly confident that things are working quite well. And also when we run regression tests, we run EasyBuild both of Python 2 and Python both on top of Python 2 and Python 3. So we have a pretty good idea of what's broken and what, what doesn't, what, what is not broken. Um, looking at supported software over the years, so this is since the very beginning when EasyBuild went public in 2012, we supported about 150 software packages. We're now ramping up to over 2,000 different software packages. So, and you can see it's pretty much going up and it's not really slowing down at all. So bioinformaticians keep popping up with new tools um, because the old ones didn't work for some reason. Um, a big part of the supported software is in bioinformatics, so about one third of all the software packages we support is in bioinformatics. And then another quarter or so is in supporting libraries and tools, so basically dependencies or tools you need, things like CMake or uh, the tools you need to build software with. And then it's a bit of a splintered view for um, the rest of the software. So it looks like we had a small dip here because we archived things in EasyBuild 4 that were no longer relevant or that had a very, very old tool chain and nobody was updating them anymore. So that's why we have a bit of a, a drop here. But it looks like if this rate, if we keep up this rate, we'll, we'll cross the 2000 um, supported software packages this year. So these counts do not count extensions. So if we, we install R with, I don't know what, close to a thousand different R packages inside of the R installation. So if you count all of those, you probably double this number here. So um, Then back to the survey. Um, one of the questions was on which operating systems are you using EasyBuild? most commonly, so people could answer multiple things here, so the numbers don't add up to 100%. Um, most prominent one is CentOS 7X here, so which was almost three quarters of people are using CentOS 7 on at least one of their systems. A big amount of people, over 15%, are still using CentOS 6, so I was a bit surprised by this, but I guess this is old systems that are still running and it's no longer worth the effort to update them to a newer OS. 
I guess that's mostly um, the issue there. Um, and we see the rise of CentOS 8 and RHEL 8 coming up as well. So that's probably going to be a big shift in 2020. Uh, with new systems, people are probably going to go with this rather than sticking to CentOS or RHEL 7. With quite a bit of usage on other operating systems as well. Ubuntu is up to 15% for the most recent version. Uh, Debian is a bit less. And then SUSE, Cray, these are the more adventurous people who want to be different <laughs> than anyone else. But we get some usage there as well. In the Python version that people used to run EasyBuild with, um, so since EasyBuild 4, you can run EasyBuild on top of Python 3. And you see the, the splintered use here, so Python, Python 3.5, 3.6, 3.7. This is probably going to stay like this for a while. It depends on which operating system you are using, uh, which is the standard Python in there. Um, so we have to be careful to keep testing with each of these Python versions and make sure EasyBuild stays compatible. 80% is still using Python 2.7, even though it's officially dead. Um, it doesn't surprise me. And that, I mean, the Python core developers are giving very mixed signals there as well. Officially, the end of life was January 1st, 2020, but they're going to do another Python 2 release in April. So I don't know what these people are smoking, but I want some of it. Um, so I expect things to change in 2020 significantly. So. I think by the end of 2020, most people will still be using Python 2 because it still works. Certainly in CentOS 7, it's the standard Python. So why would people change to something else for, for running EasyBuild? But there's hopefully going to be a big increase in the use of Python 3. So let's see if those predictions hold up um, when we do the next survey. And then this, we've asked this question, I think, in all three surveys. So how concerned are you if EasyBuild drop support for Python 2.6, which is, what is it, 15 years old by now. Um, so we're now at the level where people say, well, only 2% of the people say it's problematic or worse. So I'm sorry, but those people will have to update to a newer Python. Um, so we've deprecated support for um, Python 2.6 in EasyBuild 4.0, maybe 4.1 even. Um, but you'll now, if you're running EasyBuild on top of Python 2.6, you'll get a warning that says you're using Python 2.6. You probably should upgrade to at least a new Python 2. Um, so this change was made before we did the survey, and it seems like we did a good, uh, we anticipated things well. There. I guess this is still the people that are stuck on CentOS 6 and haven't bothered to upgrade to Python 2.7 there. But yeah, that, this shouldn't be a big hurdle to take, hopefully. Then basically the same question, but for Python 2. So what if EasyBuild goes Python 3 only? Um, would that be a problem? And there are pretty much 25% of people say, yeah, please don't. It's too early. Um, maybe they are not confident enough with EasyBuild on top of Python 3, even though it should work. Um, and if there's any issues, please let us know so we can fix them. But going forward, Python 3 is officially supported, and any version uh, newer than 3.5 should work. But for now, we will not actively drop Python 2 support. I don't see a reason. Um, I don't think EasyBuild is going to become a lot better if we only go Python 3. Um, it will take us a while to pick up on Python 3 specific features that we can use, and we're stuck to probably Python 3.5 anyway. So stuff that's only in 3.6 or 3.7 we won't be using anyway. So I think the, the jump is, it's not worth the jump yet. Um, I'm thinking about deprecating Python 2 support in the future, probably in some Easy Build 4 version, you'll start getting a warning if you're still running on top of Python 3, but maybe not bef before the end of the year, we'll see. Um, maybe we need to do another survey first and see this going down significantly before we we start trying to push people to Python 2. Which is, in the Python community, this is very controversial. Still still supporting Python 2 is already controversial. Still, support, still supporting Python 2.6 is like, what the fuck are you doing? So, but yeah, it's, uh, I guess the HPC community is, is different enough that, uh, that this makes sense. 
then uh, this is a new question in the survey. We didn't have this before. Uh, which processors are people using? Or on, for which processors are people installing software using EasyBuild? Um, so their Skylake is pretty, pretty popular. That's probably not a surprise. So are the older Intel generations. Um, even down to Harper Town and the Halem, which are quite old by now. So people are still keeping very old systems running. Uh, just because they work, I guess. Um, and we see rise of Cascade Lake and these newer architectures, and also AMD ROM is coming up. So over 10% are already using EasyBuild on an AMD ROM system. So, and I know there are some concerns there in terms of compiler and libraries you should use. Um, so this is def definitely something we will have to keep an eye on um, in the coming year and years. And then there's a small minority of people using it on power. <laughs> and even one person using it on ARM. I hope this is just for fun and not for production. But uh, So EasyBuild works on ARM. It knows about ARM. But how well bioinformatics tools will work on ARM, that's, uh, that's not very clear to me. Then the same question before accelerators. And here, NVIDIA rules. Surprise, surprise. Um, and then the most expensive Volta GPUs are, seem to be quite popular. One thing that surprised me a bit here is that only 3.5% answered we don't build software for accelerators. I don't know, maybe I'm naive in being surprised by that. HPC Ugent was quite late with buying a GPU cluster. We only have in September or something, we had our first GPU cluster, so maybe we were just very late to the party or scared to um, buy some GPUs. But it surprised me a bit that this number was... Oh, this number was so low. And then easy build tool chains. So this is a probably almost <coughs> unreadable graph, but we've been asking this in, in each survey pretty much. Which tool chains are you using? Which generation of the common FOSS and Intel tool chains are you using? A lot of people are still using 2018B, which is not ancient, but it's getting a bit old. This is based on GCC 5, I think, or 6, 6.4 probably, yeah. So we're ramping up to GCC 9, it's getting a bit old, but I guess the mo the biggest reason is that there's lots of easy config files that use this toolchain. It was used for longer than the six months we usually try to use a common toolchain, um, so it has a big stack of easy config files. And things are certainly still working there. I guess that's why people are still using it. So the, this kind of information is useful for us when we run regression tests. Um, what kind of toolchain generations do we really have to keep an eye on? It's clear that we should definitely keep testing with 2018B because lots of people are still using it. Um, FOSS toolchains are way more popular than the Intel toolchains because there's the license cost there, um, or at least there used to be, and this is changing. And here, there's no big changes between the different Intel <coughs> versions. And then the, the common tool chains with CUDA, not on top, but on the side, underneath the MPI library, is also certainly the FOSS <coughs> one. FOSS CUDA is being used quite a lot. The Intel CUDA less, but this is also more recent, so I guess that makes sense. And then there's a long, a long tail of um, other tool chains people are using, Intel, uh, compilers and MKL com combined with OpenMPI or all these other mixes. So some people are using those. We don't have a lot of easy config files in the central repository for for these tool chains, but people can of course create their own or just take a false one and tweak it to uh, whatever tool chain they, they prefer. So I'm sure people have good reasons to uh, prefer these specific tool chains. Um, Clang is not, or CLang based toolchains are not showing up here, but I think there's some interest at least to give that more attention in the coming year and years because Clang is getting a lot better, also because it's getting a, a, a decent Fortran front end finally after two or three attempts. Um, it seems like it's going to have proper support for Fortran, so it will certainly become more attractive in the coming months and years. So how frequently should we, should we be updating the FOSS and Intel common toolchains? So we, we now do it twice a year. 
Um, we try to do it in January and July, which doesn't always work. Sometimes we delay the update a bit for specific reasons. So there's no 2020A yet because we're waiting for an open API release, which has some important bug fixes. Um, so sometimes we shift things a bit, but we're for now, I think we're, we're trying to keep it up with twice a year. Some people say once a year is enough. We could try it, but I think we'll um, we'll run into annoyances there. Like for AMD Room, for AMD Roam, for example, it's quite important that we have a new tool chain that's GCC nine based. If we only do it once a year, that may mean you have to wait a year for a new tool chain that's a standard in the Easy Build community. That may be too long for some people. So that's why I guess we we can keep it up with twice a year, uh, at least for now. How many installations are people doing? So in the last year, and how many people, how many installations do people have in production? So this is a big uh, variety of answers here, from one to ten installations to over one thousand installations. So. It's quite easy to install lots of software with easy build, so that's why people manage to install over a thousand uh, or perform at the, over a thousand installations in a single year. Um, if you have a new cluster, it's quite easy to roll out a software stack on the new system um, thanks to easy build. And if you look at how many in installations people have in production across different clusters in their infrastructure, um, 10% has between five and 10,000. I, I think HPC Organic is probably in this range. Um, so that's that's quite crazy if you would have to do that by hand. It's close to impossible, even if you have a team of people. But yeah, knowing that there's a wide variety, some people are only using it for very specific things, uh, while other people are just installing everything they can get their hands on. So that's that's good to know, it's important to know. Um, it's easy build your only way of installing scientific software. So more people seem, are saying yes than before. There's a small increase here. Um, most people say it's at least the main way or um, <coughs> more common. And then 8% 8, 8 of people are also using other tools. This may be SPAC or Conda or um, wherever the software is installed, uh, is supported that they need to install, I guess. Um, and here we see uh, the answer to the question whether the people are still installing software manually. Um, we see a small increase in never. Um, so I guess EasyBuild is doing a better job or is supporting more software that people need. So that's certainly a good sign as well. Which easy config files people use? Um, stuff they write themselves. So lots of people are over 60% or Almost 70% of people are writing their own easy config files, maybe just tweaking tool chains or versions or things like this. Um, and quite a lot of people are, are using at least some of the easy configs we include with easy build. So it's definitely the effort we do to have a central repository of easy config files and accepting contributions and testing these contributions well is certainly um, appreciated. Lots of people have their own repository as well. So maybe we need to look into um, organizing or listing those repositories somewhere so people can easily search for stuff they need or want and maybe even have a way of, of pulling things in centrally if people are not actively pushing them uh, to the central repository so maybe we need to be a bit more active on that front and then yeah 25% of people just whatever wherever I can find an easy config file if it fits my need I will use it don't really care where it comes from um, custom easy blocks so over half of the people said they're not using any custom easy blocks at all which is a bit of an increase I guess that's a good sign that the easy blocks we have are more flexible or um, are enough for whatever people want to do and then some people have less than five customized easy blocks either for site specific things or maybe things they haven't contributed back yet and it's quite easy to use your own custom easy blocks and easy build. It has an include option where you can just give the location of the Python files and easy build will work as if the easy blocks are included with easy build itself. It, it will not be able to tell the difference. 
or people using site-specific customizations to easy build. So here there's a big increase and in no customizations. Almost half the people are not customizing easy build at all, um, which I think is a good sign. It, it, it tells me that there's enough flexibility that people can do what they need to do um, without having to dive into the code and change whatever we hard coded or whatever decisions we made. Um, that need seems to be dropping significantly. So the previous survey had 80% no customizations. Now we have close to half. So that's that's pretty good. I'm not sure what we did specifically to to enable that. Maybe it's the hook support that we now have, which which makes it easy. I should add a separate entry for people that use hooks, yeah, because maybe that's not clear whether that's customizing or not. Yeah, that's a good point. Take a note of that so I'll, I can do it in the next survey, make that change. You'll have to tell me again. Um, so yeah, I mean, to me, this is a good sign that we're doing quite well. Which easy build version do you use? And what reasons do you have if you're not using the latest release? So here I'm very happy that people are really much picking up on Easy Build 4, even though it was only released last September, so it's quite recent. Um, over 75% or about 75% is using a version of Easy Build 4, so that's quite good. Um, to me, it tells me we did a good job at working on things in parallel and avoiding introducing breaking changes in easy build where in easy build for wherever we could um, so people seem to be quite happy with that I made a lot of effort to document it well what breaking changes there are in easy build and try to keep them as minimal as possible and if there are breaking changes to have an easy way out like auto fixing easy config files and and things like this and not aggressively breaking things just because we feel we need to and it seems that's paying off so I was really hoping that EasyBuild will not, that people will not be stuck to EasyBuild 3, and it seems that's more or less the case. Some people though are still using EasyBuild 2. That's prehistoric. So if some people here are still doing that, let me know why. Why are you not making the jump? Uh, if, if it's just a lack of time, or if there's something in EasyBuild 3 or 4 you don't like, but is working fine in EasyBuild 2, we want to know about it so we can get you out of. Easy build too. And, and not a lot of people are using develop, so this was important to see here as well. I think most of the easy build maintainers just work straight on top of develop. And again, we even do that for production installations because we're quite confident that develop is stable. We have issues in develop occasionally, but not a whole lot. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable with doing that, but it's clear that most people rely on a release, on a stable release that's been regression tested and, and all of that. So that's important for the maintainers to realize that things that get fixed and develop, we should try and get in a release as soon as we can so people can actually pick up on it. Why are people not using the latest, latest release yet? Um, because they're happy with the current version, because they don't have time. Um, so most of these reasons are uh, not because of problems that the newest easy build version has, but other reasons. So that to me, it's good. That tells me we're not uh, making any changes that prevent people from updating. And then how, what about the frequency of the releases? Most people seem happy with that. Mo some people even think it's too frequent. So the current release uh, rate is about once every six to eight weeks we have a new easy build release so we want to push out everything we have in the develop branch into a release which I think is quite important because most people use in a release rather than a, a developed version. Seven percent of people think it, it should be more frequent yeah that's very difficult because it's a it's about a day of effort to push a release out including the regression testing, keeping an eye on the results of the tests, fixing bugs last minute that pop up during the regression test, which, which does happen. Um, so it's a lot of effort. And I'm, I'm very grateful that Miguel, who's probably watching the stream now from Singapore, um, has been helping out with the EasyBuild releases a lot more than he was already before. So he's actually now, the last 
two or three releases were done by Miguel rather than by myself. And I still help out with the regression test and all of these things, but he's saving me quite a bit of time um, by helping out with that. So thanks a lot for that. What's your favorite easy build feature? This is a bit all across the board. Some people like the automatic installation of missing dependencies. Some people like the, like the try tool chain or try software version options. Um, I'm definitely in the GitHub integration part here, so which is what Sam will be talking about tomorrow in the tutorial. If we wouldn't have these features in easy build, we would not see the growth that we're seeing in contributions and we will not be able to keep up with incoming contributions. So for myself as an easy build maintainer, this is very important. And there may be some things here. Um, there's actually features here that are not mentioned at all, which I may talk about on Friday, in the 10 things you didn't know about easy build, or things that we maybe should promote a bit more uh, that people should at least know about. And then maybe a bit of a dangerous question, but which parts of easy, of easy build do you not like currently? So we, I gave a bunch of suggestions. So things that I, I know are not perfect or are certainly up for improvement or complaints that have been coming back for, um, for a while from several people. So those were added as possible answers and there was a, an, open, um, an open field as well where you could type anything. Um, so 20% 20, 20 of people added something in the other category and I'll have to go through them because there's a long list of things. I didn't have the time for that yet. Um, here the thing that jumps out most is the fixed versions for dependencies we have in easy config files. So there's very little flexibility. You cannot say use CMake bigger than 3.5 or anything like that. Everything is a very specific version. Um, <coughs> About one third of the people are not very happy with that. I'm sure Massimiliano is smiling now in the back because the flexibility in terms of juggling different versions is, is one of the major features in SPAC. So he can talk about that um, at the end of the day. In, in Easy Build, I think it's, first of all, if we would add more flexibility, we would shoot ourselves in the foot, I think, in terms of testing things. If we put out easy config files there that have flexible versions, you don't really know what people will be using um, to install the software with. And then some people will bump into a problem because they're using a newer CMake, which has a bug, while other people using the previous CMake, which was working fine, are not seeing. And all these issues will, will be popping up. And also, how do you regression test things that can float around everywhere? So you, it, it, it would be very difficult to to test things. And then I think that, that has been an issue in SPAC as well. Like, how, what do we test? How do we test all these things? And you can talk about this at the end of the day. Um, a couple of things I added specifically because I know they're up for improvement are the error messages. So if Easybuild does an installation, it works fine. Sanity check passes, everything is happy, you're, you're OK. If there's a make command that fails and you get an a pretty weird looking error message at the end and you have to start hunting in the easy build log what the actual problem is. I think we can do a better job of, of highlighting what the <coughs> probable cause of the of the problem is. Like finding the first error message in the log file and mentioning that in the output. Maybe some, some highlighting with, with red colors or I don't know what. I think we can do a lot a better job there. And just improving some of the errors that easy build itself produces as well. If it's if it needs a source file and it could not download it, and it's trying to do the installation, it will, it will now bar for the very ugly error message, and I think we can do a better job. I was trying to find this file, I looked there, couldn't find it, and maybe this is how you fix it by using this download URL yourself or something like that. Yeah, so lots of things to work on here, and I don't think there, there's any big surprises here.
Um, so that's, that's good to know about. What surprised me here is the pink bar, Conda. So over a quarter of people combine EasyBuild and Conda. I, I don't. And I also try to tell our researchers not to um, use Conda on our system because at first it works and then six months later they realize they have a big issue and they have to redo <coughs> everything or just doesn't work anymore. So if people are doing this here, I'm interested in hearing how they're doing that, why they're doing that. Um, so definitely at coffee breaks or lunch, come and tell me what's, what's up with that. So this, this surprised me a bit. Um, lots of people are also using Singularity and containers. 10% um, of people are still using Singularity too. Yeah, it's the same thing with EasyBuild. People are stuck for, to old versions for God knows what reason. Um, this is quite high, it's is it 45 to 50%. So are people using EasyBuild in containers here or just containers on the side because the software comes as a container pre-built? <coughs> so also here, if people have more information on that, I would like to hear about what's going on here. And then, yeah, some of the other tools are more niche, I guess. In terms of module naming schemes, so what, what do the names of modules that you install with EasyBuild <laughs> look like? Lots of people are using the default um, EasyBuild module naming scheme or are maybe not aware that you can tweak the naming scheme to your liking. Um, this is one of the gaps in the documentation right now. It's not really clearly mentioned in the documentation but <coughs> what type of naming schemes EasyBuild supports or how to use a different naming scheme. So we should probably fix that. Um, one of the nice, easy, cool features that EasyBuild has is support for hierarchical naming schemes. So who has no idea what a hierarchical module naming scheme is? Everybody knows what it is? Oh. Okay, so. Just very quickly, a flat naming scheme looks like this. If you do module avail, you can see everything. You have these pretty long names. In terms of easy build speak, you'll see the software, software version, toolchain, and toolchain version, and maybe even a suffix at the end, so you get a pretty long module name. If you organize your modules in a hierarchy, <coughs> it looks a bit different. If you do module avail after starting a new session, you will only see a couple of modules, typically compilers. And then as soon as you load a compiler and you run module avail again, you'll see the MPIs that are built for that compiler. If you load an MPI, you will see <coughs> applications or other libraries uh, built with that compiler and that MPI. And the good thing here is the module names become very short. You can no longer combine things by accident that will not work together because they were built with a different compiler or a different MPI. So this has a lot of advantages. One disadvantage is that your users need to know what a compiler and an MPI is, or at least have a notion of, of what that is. Which sounds like a joke, but in reality, lots of people just don't know or don't care and probably don't have to, have to either. So, now, organizing your modules in this way has a lot of small details that you have to get right for this to work well, and EasyBuild knows how to do that. So you can just tell EasyBuild, use a hierarchy, and it organizes things in the right way for you, which is, uh, which is very useful. Then how long are modules installed? Or how long do modules stay there once, once they are installed with EasyBuild? Lots of people said forever. So the forever means as long as the system is alive. Uh, the system is dead, there's no point in keeping the installations anymore. So we're also in this box in Ghent and should probably do a better job of actively pushing people to new installations, deprecating all installations, because we often see things, we often see people using very old software or very old tool chains that are slower or that are, are known to be problematic. Um, yeah, we're not doing a very good job there and it seems like lots of other sites are in the same uh, category. And in terms of community, <coughs> EasyBuild mailing list and the, the Slack slash IRC channel, although IRC is pretty much dead nowadays, it's not very, very active anymore. Um, 
we see less participation in the mailing list and more on Slack, which is probably not a surprise. So even though we still get about 800 messages a year on the mailing list, um, yeah, people seem to like the interactivity of Slack a bit more, I guess. Um, what's also important here is that a big part of the Easy Build community only reads mailing list or Slack or is not even interested or not has not joined yet. So it's not because we ask the community something on mailing list or Slack or both that we get a good coverage in the in the community. That's very important to realize as well. So lots of people don't speak up for whatever reason they have, mm -hmm. and it's important to realize that as as Easy Build maintainers and developers. Subscribers to the mailing list keeps going up. Um, so even though it's getting less active, it still it now has over 270 people, which is very good. Um, Slack channel, which we, oh, this is traffic on the mailing list. So about <laughs> 700 messages a year, which is enough that you have to keep attention to it. Um, but it's certainly less than the over 1000 we had in 2017, thanks to Slack. This is the activity on the Slack channel. So we have over 200 people there um, that have an account. And about in 2019, about 50 people that were active on a weekly basis. So that's very good. If you're not on Slack yet, there's a, a small app here that you can drop in your email address so you get an invite to join Slack. <coughs> it's, a, it's probably the best way now to reach out to the EasyBuild community to get some quick help with things you're stuck with. And then before we take a look at contributors, uh, where's Oriol? Should we do the coffee break first? Or should we continue? Who's up for coffee? Yeah. So maybe we should have a, a short coffee break first before I give some more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Then we'll have some time for questions as well. So there's. Yeah. Just for people on the stream, then what time are we coming back at? In half an hour, probably. Okay. So half past 11, we'll continue. So I'll continue um, with the survey. So we asked people if they actively contribute back to EasyBuild. Um, a lot of people just over half just report issues or complain uh, that things don't work as expected, which is a form of contributing back. If we don't know there's a problem, We'll probably not fix it. Um, there's a again significant growth in Slack usage, and we also see more people claiming that they contrib contribute back by submitting pull requests to e for easy configs. And we also see this in the other statistics that I'll show. That's very good, and a decline in people that don't contribute or at least claim they don't contribute. So that's good, I guess. The rest is more or less stable. <clears throat> um, we look at the forks on, on GitHub of the different easy build repositories. So the green line is the easy configs repository where we get by far the most pull requests. We have uh, the counting is a bit weird because uh, GitHub says we have 415 forks. While if you pull down the data, you get 350 forks, but there's indirect forks as well so people forking from a fork and apparently that doesn't show up here but yeah you get an idea it's going up um, keeps going up at the same rate so community is still growing and all the repositories are getting less forks because there you have to be, not just change a version to make a pull request but actively do some python coding or the bottom line write some documentation which is the least popular way of contributing unfortunately but yeah, community is still growing, is, is mostly what you get from this graph. If we look at pull requests to the framework repository over the years, um, the last year was a bit of a, a bump. That's mostly because of the effort in porting to Python 3. So I did way more pull requests than I'm, I've done in previous years, mostly because I, I tried to do things in small chunks, let's say do the porting in small bits and pieces so I could do it in between other work. So it's uh, it's about, I don't know what, 50 pull requests um, in total for the for the porting to Python 3. 
Um, and we're now about over a quarter of the, of the contributions to <coughs> framework are done outside of the HPC again team. So it's still, we're still uh, responsible for most of the development there and I'm hoping to get that down a bit, uh, but it's not that easy. For easy blocks, we do see more and more contributions coming from people other than myself. Um, so I only did half of the pull requests there and the others were about 50-50 between the other maintainers or outside contributors. So, so that's quite good. At least updating easy blocks for new software versions because th things have changed or making enhancements to generic easy blocks is also done by people not in the team of maintainers. So that's very good. And then easy configs. This is a bit scary. So in 2016, we, we added the GitHub integration to EasyBuild, which makes it very easy to, to contribute back easy config files. You can do it from the EasyBuild command line. So you don't have to leave your terminal. You don't have to click on GitHub. Um, you can just open pull request straight from the EasyBuild command line. It was stable, more or less stable in 17 and 18. But last year, we got over 2,000 pull requests in the Easy Configs repository. So that's, that's nuts, right? If you take into amount the number of days you work in a year, it's like 200, 220, uh, something like that. So you're looking at 10 pull requests per day that you have to process. So that's quite a lot. Um, we see an increase in the, the ratio of pull requests by non-maintainers. So that's quite good as well. External contributors are opening more pull requests. That means we're getting new software, we're getting software updates that we don't have to spend time on other than reviewing and testing, um, which we should be happy with, but it's a lot of work to uh, process all these contributions. There's also good news here. Um, so this is the same graph, just with different categories. Here, the darkest green is me merging pull requests. So that's about, uh, what is it, 600 out of the 2,000 something. So about a quarter of the pull requests are handled by me. The other maintainers are doing a very good job of processing the, the contributions as well. Um, this is things or time I don't have to spend in looking at incoming contributions. So we have this maintainer of the week role um, where we try to find maintainers who have time to spend at least a couple of hours that week looking at incoming contributions. And that seems to be helping and making sure that things get processed even though there's a growth in, in contributions. So hopefully this keeps um, improving and we can actually, or I can actually make the dark green bar go down um, without leaving contributions un, unprocessed. And then the right graph is showing how many pull requests were opened via the new PR feature in EasyBuild, so straight from the EasyBuild command line. And that, that has increased significantly, both the number of pull requests and also the ratio so over three quarters of pull requests are open this way, which is very good for a number of reasons. For the contributor, it's easy. So he doesn't have to leave his terminal. He doesn't have to clean up branches in Git. Um, he doesn't have to figure out what the name of the easy config file should be or where it goes. All of that is handled by EasyBuild. And also for maintainers, it's easy because they see it's a standard pull request. They can, we can easily see it was opened via new PR. So we, there's a bunch of things we don't have to check because we know EasyBuild gets it right. Um, so it's a lot easier to, to process a pull request that was opened this way than one that was opened manually, which we, of course, are still happy to process manual pull requests as well, but it takes more time for us. So if you're interested in contributing back, definitely take a look at the documentation we have on the GitHub integration and check out Sam's tutorial tomorrow. And in terms of unique contributors, we still see this going up as well. So we, we broke the 200 unique contributors in easy configs last year. And it looks like this year we're going to break the 250. So it keeps going up. New people keep coming up and contribute to easy build, uh, mostly in easy configs, but also in framework and easy blocks. So it looks like the, the Python code that we have is fairly accessible for people to dive into and make changes and make improvements as well. And we've put a lot of effort in making it accessible. And then this is unique contributors per year. 
Um, so we get 90 something con uh, unique contributors every year for easy configs in the last couple of years. Um, for framework, we have about 25 different people making pull requests every year. For easy blocks, it's a little bit more than that. And this stays pretty stable, um, both for framework and, well, there's a bit of shift up and down, but it's not rapidly going down or something like that. So, so that's good. More contributors may be interesting here, but if, if we get 100 contributors to framework, reviewing these pull requests and making sure everything is fine, there is a lot more work than easy configs. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the current situation. Let's, let's keep it at that. And then the last question in the survey was, um, how do you rate the overall quality of easy build? Lots of people seem quite happy with it. And apparently Massimiliano and Todd also did the survey because they said it could be better. Uh, it's just a joke, but overall it's, it's fairly positive. And I, I agree, it could be better and there's things we should fix um, or things we should improve on. But overall it's very, very positive, so quite happy with that. Then a bit of outlook into 2020. So <coughs> Some goals I have for easy build, things I certainly want to work on or things I know that we'll have to pay attention to is the, well, the incoming contributions for easy configs. We now have over 2,000 PRs a year, which is uh, very happy with that, but it's also a lot of work. In 2020, we will break the, the 10,000 easy config PRs since the beginning of time. Um, so that's a lot of stuff to manage. We will soon have over 2,000 supported software packages, which is a lot of stuff to test for every release. So we have to get better at this in the sense that we have to automate this more where we can. So we're already doing a lot of automation, um, but we can do better. We can maybe even set up a way of automatically submitting test reports for easy config pull requests after, review, after a maintainer has reviewed the PR and says, this looks good to me, but it needs to be tested. You could just maybe set a label and then a bot could wake up and say, oh, I can test this and, and actually do the installations and report back on whether things work or not. Um, there's a couple of technical hurdles there to, to go through and some security related things on GitHub that you have to be careful about. So you don't want to have GitHub tokens leaking into environments and, and things like this. Um, but it's certainly possible. So it's a bit of work to set it up, but we, we, I'm sure we can do it. And also as a contributor yourself, you can help <coughs> making things easier to process. If you open a pull request and the tests fail, please see if you can fix the test yourself just by adding commits in the pull request. Um, submit your test report yourself, so show that it works for you and tell us on what kind of system it works for you, which Python version you were using, whether it's AMD Rome or Intel Haswell. So this was all included in the test report. Um, so it's quite easy to, to upload a test report for the pull request you open, and that helps us to be more confident that this is probably good to go and uh, to take a look at it and merge it quickly. So maybe we should also get better there in explaining to contributors how they can help uh, in helping us. Um, the easy build regression test that we do now, so for every release we try to rebuild all the easy config files we ship. So by now it's eight or 9,000 easy config files. There's always surprises that pop up. Easy config files that are broken because they auto download stuff from the internet and AWS is down or whatever happens or, or things have moved. Um, so yeah, <coughs> you need to shift or sift through these uh, test installations and see what's actually a bug in easy build or is failing for another reason. And it's also, it's, it's too manual now. The, the regression test is sort of scripted and sort of not, and certainly checking the results is, is a lot of work now. So that's, it slows down the release process quite a bit. Um, we don't have the regression test results public now. We should probably have a public dashboard so people can see this is broken in this, in this situation, but it works on maybe another system. Um, <coughs> And I think reframe, which Vasilis will talk about tomorrow, could be a good way of improving on the current situation. 
the one thing I've been wanting to do for a long time as well is actually run the test installations in a container environment. So you have full control over packages in the operating system, which, which operating system and version you're using, um, different easy build configurations that maybe you can test in parallel, like hierarchical and flat naming scheme and all these things, RPOD, no RPOD, all these things. Um, it's fairly easy to do if you use container images to just run easy build in. Uh, it's doable, but again, it needs time to set these things up and, and make it work. A big help there is the the test infrastructure we have access to now, at, which is housed at CSCS, which is a shared infrastructure for the easy build maintainers. So all the easy build maintainers get a login there, and we basically share our test installations there, so we don't have to rebuild things over and over again if another maintainer has done it before. And that helps us a lot in saving time um, in testing contributions. And maybe we can even take it as far as using QEMU to emulate processor architectures we don't have access to. So if we have an Intel Haswell system, but we also want to test for Skylake, something like QEMU could, could help there to like sit in between. And it will make the installations slower, maybe even a lot slower, but meh, we don't really care. And then the error reporting that popped up in the survey um, as well, I hope we find time to make it significantly better than what EasyBuild throws at you now and basically forces you to dive into the log file um, to figure things out. And I know there's some ideas there. I think SPAC uses the a mechanism from CMake or error patterns that it, it got from CMake um, to make errors stand out a bit more or to, to help you to pinpoint the exact issue. We should probably look at what they did and then have a better way of doing the same thing. And then some, some challenges, certainly for 2020, but probably after that as well. So I have the impression scientists are getting more and more software packages that they want to have installed, certainly in bioinformatics, it, it never ends. Um, they don't open a single installation request, but they open a dozen at a time, and then every week again. So it, it, it never ends, so that's something we'll yeah, we'll have to make easier to install new software or become better at sharing things than we are already before, like making it easier to discover things in other repositories that people have that are not central so we can leverage each other's work. One um, other concern that has popped up quite a lot recently is the, the discussion about R and the I don't know what, something thousand, something ex extensions that we have in the R installation. It's becoming an issue to manage that, to update that. John's easy, easy update tool helps a lot with that, but it's still a concern. And also recently we've, we've noticed that the downloads from the CRAN repository for R packages, um, if you download the source star balls, the checksums change for no reason at all. If you compare a new download within an, the download you've done before and you do a diff on the source code, there's literally no differences in the source code, only the publication date of the package changes, which changes the checksum, which breaks easy builds because it checks the checksum. And I'm like, what's going on there? So one thing I, I would want to do in the coming weeks is find a good contact at, at CRAN, one of the people that maintains CRAN and ask them what is going on, why does this happen? And can you avoid it or can we, well, we probably can't, but is there a way to, to fix this? Like what they do on, on PyPy, the Python package repository is they hard block you from re-uploading a package with the same version. Apparently CRAN is not doing that because people republish the same version, even if they don't have code changes for, I don't know what reason, is it a cron running somewhere? Are they accidentally running a published script? I don't know, but CRAN should probably block them from doing that because it doesn't make sense. So maybe we can try and complain to the CRAN maintainers and just explain why it's an issue. Uh, whether that will work out or not, I'm not sure. Um, we're now running the repository, the easy build repository test in both Travis and GitHub Actions, which is working fine. I have a, a bot running which re-triggers failing tests in Travis if they fail for no good reason. 
So something that often happens in Travis is the tests fail because there's no internet connection in whatever VM the tests are running in. And if you just re-trigger the tests again, suddenly they pass because somebody fixed the internet. Um, we don't see that a lot in, in GitHub Actions, so there we don't need a bot that keeps an eye on things and triggers things. I'm a bit in, in doubt whether we should switch away entirely from Travis and only test in GitHub Actions and just stop dealing with all these, these issues on Travis. Um, there's an issue there when you open a pull request and the tests fail for a good reason my bot will notice and will add a comment in the pull request saying this failed this is the error message please try and fix it that only works because it keeps an eye on travis and it's not easy to make it work the same way with github actions again for the same reason that you don't want to make a token leak um it's a, it's a bit technical why why it doesn't work but it's not that easy to fix the bot also for travis so that's why I'm, yeah certainly need to spend more time to switch entirely away from Travis. And then one thing I also think will be an, an issue or we'll certainly have to be careful with is we now support both Python 2 and Python 3, but every new Python 3 release has some minor breaking changes and we'll need to be aware of those and, and update EasyBuild Framework, maybe even, easy, maybe even easy blocks to take into account these breaking changes. So we'll have to keep pace with what things Python is, is breaking. And again, I really think they're avoiding to, to release Python 4 because they don't want to go through this whole mess and people joking about it again. <coughs> um, so it's something we'll have to deal with. Then Python 2 is dead or very soon will be, um, which is not a, a concern for EasyBuild itself anymore, but there will be lots of scientific software packages out there that only support Python 2, not Python 3. And we'll need to have we'll need to deal with that in some way or another. I don't know if this is going to be a big issue, but how long we'll have to drag Python 2 forward is not clear at all. Certainly beyond 2020, because there will be lots of scientific software that just is frozen in time and nobody will fix it for Python 3. Um, we're, we're slowly coming out of the Intel only age in terms of processors. So AMD is back and very much alive. Um, power and ARM are getting more interesting as well for people to, to invest into. Um, AMD Rome, which already we know is, needs very recent GCC, probably or may need a different um, library than OpenBlast, maybe Bliss or their own fork of Bliss um, for very good Blast layback performance. So it, it's starting to complicate things a bit. It complicates testing for us as well. Like we don't have access to a power system. And even if we do, retesting everything on power takes a lot more time. So um, it complicates things a bit. And also, especially with AMD Rome in mind, <coughs> I'm not sure whether there's gonna be an impact on the common tool chains as well. Can we still, go with the FOSS that is GCC, OpenAPI, OpenBlast, F50W, or do we have to start varying things based on the architecture you're on? Maybe for AMD you want Bliss and not OpenBlast, while on Intel you want to stick to OpenBlast or MKL, and yeah, things are getting complicated. And then one thing we've been in touch with, with uh, been in touch about with Intel itself is their new One API thing that they've been making lots of uh, noise about, certainly at supercomputing. Uh, we've set up a conf call with Intel by their invita uh, invitation recently. And apparently this is going to replace Parallel Studio. So what's now Intel compilers, MPI, MKL, and a bunch of other libraries next to it, uh, is going to be included in one MPI and one API with some other things, a new <coughs> distributed C++ compiler or whatever it's called. So they will actually have two C++ compilers in there or, or data parallel C++ compiler. Um, they've also renamed a couple of things like it's no longer ICC, but it's ICX. It's no longer IFORT, but it's IFX. And they seem to think it's a good idea. So in EasyBuild, that's not a big issue. It's just a version check and then using a different name but I'm pretty sure it will be more than just changing commands. They'll change options, they'll change behavior, they change defaults. 
and we'll have to be aware of that and start playing around with it and see what the impact is going forward. They're, they're not giving us a date for this now, but if you look at the versions they use in the beta, it looks like one API will be the new thing in 2021 and they'll just drop on parallels to you. No, there's no confirmation on that and they're very careful with, with specifying dates, but that's what it looks like. The versions are like 2021. <coughs> yeah, something. Dot three, yeah, yeah. So you see 2021 popping up. And when we had the call and we pointed this out to the Intel guy, he was like, huh, I didn't see this yet, but I don't know when it's gonna happen. 2021 is when it's gonna happen. They changed, if you install one API, first of all, it's not a single installation. It's like a base package and an HPC package and a bioinformatics or I don't know what, deep learning separate package. So you have to install things on top of each other. And the, the way it's organized internally on the file system is very different as well. So things have moved around. It's cleaner than what it was before. So you have a compiler directory and an KL directory and an API directory. So it's pretty clean. But yeah, EasyBuild will need to know where things are, where to pick things up. Uh, so it will be a bit of work to, to make that work. Good thing is we have a good contact at Intel that we promised we will, we will try this by the end of, what do you say, February or March? And we're gonna couple, we're gonna give them feedback on this so we actually, we can probably influence this a little bit. We already told them, yeah, don't change the compiler commands if you don't have to. If you don't have a good reason, don't do that because it's gonna, people will have to actively switch to it and it's gonna be an issue. And they seem to listen, whether it's actually gonna make a difference, I'm not sure. <coughs> so yeah, lots of things to worry about, maybe not um, <coughs> lose sleep over, but still to be aware of. And then, and now I'm getting a bit creative. These are just ideas for things we could add to EasyBuild. So this is not implemented at all. If you try this, it will hard fail because the option is even is not even there. Um, but one of the things I've been hoping to find time for is to um, basically go beyond what we now have with dash dash try. So you can do try option, uh, try toolchain to try installing it existing easy config file with a different tool chain um, and it knows about sub tool chain so if you do dash dash robot it will do the mapping from the sub tool chain as well but the command line interface it has I'm, I'm not very happy with it we have a try tool chain we have a try software version we don't have an easy way to tweak dependencies yet which we probably should have but I don't want to do with try dependencies <coughs> and then try whatever else should probably you know yeah have a new command line option that tackles this in a better way and what I came up last night after having three glasses of wine is something like this um, a new option which we could call tweak or I don't care how it's named but you could specify things to change like in this case only change the version in this case only change the tool chain to this tool chain name and this tool chain version only bump the Python version that's used in here or well the second one is supposed to be something else but you could Rather than hard specify the versions, you could give it a file that specifies the versions because maybe you're keeping track of a list of 100 dependencies that you want to use specific versions for. So this could be both command line or in a file. You could make it robot aware, just like try toolchain is. Um, so you could change a version, change the toolchain, and then the robot will make sure the toolchain is also changed for the dependencies that are in here. Or maybe even go as far as having something that allows you to update to whatever the latest version is that's available. So something that would, for Python packages or for R in this case, would go to CRAN, check the version, update to that version, check if there's dependencies that should be added, add the dependencies and the latest version. So basically what Easy Update does, but then integrate it into, into the framework. <laughs> and in, in implementing this, we could take this step by step. It doesn't have to do the whole thing at once to make it usable. We could do Start with a tweak that can only tweak the version, and then do the tool chain combined with dash dash robot as a next step, and then go like that. So it could be a stepwise thing. But I think it's a cleaner, a cleaner interface to, to do these updates. And I'm sure surprises will pop up here that we think that we can implement, but are in practice are quite quite difficult. So that this is something I hope to find time for 
um, in 2020. So you could merge my PR. I could merge your PR, which does this? Yeah. Does, does which part? It does all this tweaking of the length. Okay, I should take another look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's things flying around that are, I mean, some of these things are already supported with try software version, try toolchain, and the robot thing that's already there. Maybe we need to yeah, make it a little bit more accessible or a bit more uniform. And apparently I should look at Alan's pull request for the dependency stuff. Yeah. <coughs> um, and then sort of what I mentioned for the, the latest version of extensions, you could extend that to just software versions as well. If you want to install the latest TensorFlow, why do you have to go to PyPy first and check what the latest version is? Just let Easyable check it for you. So you do EB update version, dash dash robot, and it could do the software and all the dependencies, update to latest, give me easy configs for that, and then let's try and install these and see what happens. Uh, that's easier said than done. For things like Python packages, you have a single repository to query. For R, you have a single repository to query. But say you have open foam, where do you query the version? How do you query the version? How do you query the five or 10 dependencies it has? So everything is gonna be different for each of these non-standard things. So that makes it trickier and you need to have a good way to implement that. You don't want framework to be aware of how to check an open foam version that should be done in the open foam easy block. So you need a change in the internal API. So easy blocks can tell to framework how to check for a version, or how to check what the latest version is. So this, ha this has to be worked out. And then something I actually did for a while and opened a pull request for, but nobody merged it. It, it wasn't finished, so it, it doesn't make sense to merge it yet. But is to have a, so we, in the latest release, we have a copy EC option to copy an existing easy config file to somewhere else, a show EC to just print it to the screen. So that, these are quite new. And I, I use these names because in the longer run, I would like to add options like new EC where you can just, you can just throw stuff at it without telling it what it actually is. And easy build can do a good guess of what the values that you pass mean. I mean, if you give it something like this, it's a string and I don't know what it is. It's probably the software name. This has, digits and dots, that's probably the version. And it just can take the values as they come and make an intel intelligent choice of what they are. Um, you, and then you can pass it uh, the location where to download the sources so it can know this looks like something I can unpack. So this is the file name, this is the source URL. And if you then make it smart enough to say, this value is the dependencies, so don't try to make an intelligent guess, but use what I tell you. Up to some level, I got this to work, and it's like, it's AI and easy build. Or you can sell it that way. Uh, but at least this can give you an easy config file to start from, so you don't have to remember what the syntax is in an easy config file. Just throw stuff at it, it gives you a file, and at least that's a, that's a template or a starting point you can use. This is fun to work on, but yeah start consuming as well. That's what I have in terms of presentation. I'm sure there's lots of questions. There will be plenty of time throughout the coming days as well. Coffee breaks, lunch, dinner. If there's more difficult stuff, we can discuss it over wine or beer. Um, but yeah, grab me or grab any of the easy <coughs> maintainers with the red um, name tag if you have any questions. And we can probably take some questions now as well. So we have some time uh, until lunch. Lunch is at one and John's talk is about half an hour. So yeah, if there are any questions, we can take them now as well. Or maybe people watching the stream on Slack can ask questions too and Hoke will send them to me. I can try and come up with an answer. Any questions? Yeah. Maybe pass the mic so people on the stream hear the question as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Kenneth, for a nice talk. Um, I actually have a comment, more than a question or a discussion point, whatever you want. Okay. Um, you were talking about the dependency versions and how you don't want to 
uh, get rid of the fixed dependency versions because it makes it more difficult to test things. Mm -hmm. uh, I completely agree. I'm very much in favor of giving something where you say, okay, you know, I built it with this dependency and at least I got it to work. So there's at least one person in the world who got it to work with this dependency version. Yeah. That's nice to know. Um, but can't we do something like uh, an argument saying, okay, now I want to do a try argument. I want to try it with flexible dependencies. Try it with uh, a dependency larger than this version or something like that. This could be implemented in the tweak idea, right? But then you, you really make a new... Yeah, I mean, you make an easy yeah. config with a fixed version, but you, you get a command line option to change the version in place. Yeah, but then you still need to figure out, oh, what do I have available on my system, right? You might already have, let's say, a CMake available you, you on the system. You could ask EasyBuild to detect say, okay, it. You could say, okay, anything above CMake 3. Point something yeah. goes. Or, or you could ask EasyBuild to detect it. Rather than, yeah. than hard fixing a version here, you could say Python yeah. colon avail. So whatever module I have that works, Use that version. That, that, that's what my PR does at the moment. Okay. So <laughs> that's great because that will be my preference to still have in the easy config one version where you say, okay, this is what we test, this is what we guarantee works. Yeah. But I have something and an else. To say, and, yeah. uh, feel free to try whatever you want. It makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how old is that pull request? A, a year. A year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, com it's a bit complex. It's, it's not the. It, it, it's not the dependencies that are a problem, it's like things like uh, version suffixes. Yeah. Because you have things like bin utils version suffixes, which also have a version, right? So you have double versions going on. Mm -hmm. um, so to update to the latest means actually updating two things Maybe at once. Maybe two or, yeah. yeah. Um, and the same with the Python, although that kind of, that kind of was disappearing because we were having Python 2 and 3, the combined thing, so that mm -hmm. would have been solved, and now it's appear again right? it's coming back because we're, back because we're mostly going forward yeah. with only python 3 yeah. but there is something there to to, 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 to look do that. yeah yeah but that's the, that's what makes it uglier than it needs to be <laughs> yeah i i did a very quick try not in framework itself but in a in a script a python script that uses easy build to do some of these things and i quickly bumped into issues like this as well like yeah. at first sight it's very straightforward, but then there's corner cases that you have to take into yeah. account to complicate things. Yeah. And then it's this, it's this issue as well with the with the extensions, because the extensions are hidden inside the files themselves, right? So yeah. so if you want to update extensions as well, you can, yeah, there are other things as well mm -hmm. that you might want to do. But yeah, I think we have to pull things apart. Maybe yeah. do it first for dependencies and Extensions are really a separate problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. then you, that's, that's why I Take think the implementation of something like this has to be stepwise. You have to have a plan yes. yeah. and do it piece by piece. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to make a comment about uh, the fixed versioning. And uh, I'm surprised you don't bring this up, but that's part of the selling point of easy build for us at our site is, is the idea of reproducible science. Yeah. And if people are publishing papers and they're using a very you know, something from an easy config from a module mm -hmm. that's 100% reproducible. Anyone can build that and reproduce that science. So um, that's one of the big, big features that we push with easy build locally at our site is this mm -hmm. idea of, you know, your paper would be reproducible at another site. Yep. <coughs> yeah, that's, I guess that's also the reason why we have fixed versions. Another reason is it's a lot easier to have fixed versions than to make it flexible. So I know in, in SPAC it's very flexible, but it partially has, has blown up in the face of it as well. And I'm sure Massimiliano will disagree with me, but uh, I, based on what I see passing by on the mailing list, I'm on the SPAC mailing list as well. I'm silent, but I'm there. Um, so I see some people sometimes running into issues because of the flexibility that SPAC has. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. In the sense, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, get, get the mic first. Maybe we can get back to this at the end of the day when you do the SPAC okay. talk. Yeah. Whatever. Because I, I will ask you questions like this anyway. The, the, bottom line, the bottom line is that we are very flexible, but we adopt with the SPAC environment a model that is more or less that of Angular, if you want to think of that. Having a manifest file in which you specify your abstract request, but when you install, you also get a log file 
with all the details, yeah. like pinned down to the last so, page. So once you have something installed, you can get a file where everything is pinned down. You can give this to somebody else. Yeah. You get all the versions, all the configurations, yeah. uh, information on the target you yeah. are installing on. Uh, and are, would you say the chances of that to work for somebody else are as high as they are in easy build? Or are there hundred the <laughs> percent? Oh, okay. so maybe, no, I maybe mean, are, are, are there reasons why a log file you give me would not work for me for spec version or so processor you, architecture? Using the same uh, spec version, Using the same version has to be the same version. Well, spec. Using the same, uh, spec version. Yeah. I would say. It's more or less the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for easy build, right? So I guess one main difference between easy build and spec is then that in easy build we have a central repository where we share stuff. That's not there for spec, is there? So central repository. Central repository where we basically share what you call log files. Okay. Um, we don't have that yet. We don't have that yet. And is it is that just something the spec community is not interested in, or? No, no, it, it, something in the main thing. Okay. So one of the latest features uh, that we got in is integration with GitLab CI. So basically you can have runners, you can push your results to a dashboard. We just don't have yet a public dashboard to, let's say, share the result and say this is official, but you can build your own. Yeah, we have yeah. all the tools to have, a, let's say, cycle uh, dashboard or uh, cycle um, CI pipeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. this stuff you'll talk about in your talk as well? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, maybe I didn't see this in the documentation, but is there an option for dash dash new PR to do a local syntax check and if the checksum is yes, there, and that's something Sam will talk about as well. Okay, great. There's a a check contrib option. That scans your easy config files, um, and that can tell you about code style issues and like missing checksum, some things. It doesn't do everything though, because what we do in a pull request, we run a bunch of checks only for the files that are touched in the pull request. That's not something Check on Trip is doing now, and that's something we have to fix because we have one way of checking things and then another way of checking things in Check on Trip. Those should be one and the same, not two different things. Thanks. Is anyone keeping an eye on questions on the Slack channel as well? Nothing here. Okay. Yeah. Cheers up. Yeah. So one <coughs> of the features that I really use um, is the searching, the dry run option. And I've noticed that over the releases, this feature is becoming slower and slower. And it's obviously because of the number of easy configs that we have. Yes. Good and point, yeah. now it's almost to an extent where it's just not even really practical to like run it, it just like just takes forever. And given that, you know, in the slides as you mentioned, we're getting like, you know, 10,000 easy configs by this year. <coughs> Is there any plan to kind of that's a, manage that's a this good, in a way that good it's... Good point. So first of all, yeah. there's a, a bug we fixed recently that should fix some of that. I don't, is it 410 or 411? There was something we fixed along those lines. So. If you're not using the latest version yet, try the latest version, it may be better. But another idea I've had, and I should have mentioned it on the slides, is to have support in easy build to build a, a cache like Elmod has. So when, when you install easy build, it comes with, let's say, 10,000 easy config files. It could have a single file that has all the needed information, like where are the easy config files which are available, in a single file, which will be a lot faster. It loads the file, it can uh, just load that in memory and then scan through that rather than hitting the file system all the time. That's the main reason why things are so slow. So that's that's one idea and I don't think it's very difficult to implement that. But when you want to fix something with a the cache, then you have two problems, right? You have the problem and the cache uh, to worry about. And I'm sure Robert will, will tell you the same thing. Elmot has a, a 
good spider cache that it can use, but now you have to have a cache that you have to keep up to date. So there's a, a bit of issues around that. But that would probably solve the, the issue with dry run being slow. The, uh, another problem with dry run being slow is the file system. Yeah, well, we, 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 we changed file system where we store the software and the dry run speed increased by, what you say, five times, ten times? Yeah. No, yep. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 lots of small files, and that's not typically a, new, a common use case on HPC. So yeah, but I guess if you did have if you did have a cache file that came with the release, for example, then at least you'd be caching that ten thousand or whatever that is, right? Yes. That figure. Yeah, and then so we, we whatever could, people do locally would be on top. But then yeah, we can probably be, depending on what goes in the cache file, I don't. I would expect that. The location of the files will have to be in the cache file, uh, which you cannot do. You cannot pre-cache that. It depends on where EasyBuild is installed. A install. You can we could probably make it rel relative to where the cache file itself is, or something like that. That would help. So if the cache file is next to your EasyConfig files, you know where stuff is. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do file system lookups for that. But yeah, so we, we can ship a cache file or and have an option in EasyBuild to update the EasyConfig cache if you're adding stuff to it. And, but then you, you need to do things like keep track of how, when the cache was updated, maybe print a warning if it's longer than a day or a week, make that configurable, so, yeah. But I mean, even if you did it for the stuff in the release, not updated at all, right? Just do it for those. That's already that could, files, yeah, right? That, that could already be a big help. But I'm sure people here have their own repository, which yeah. also has hundreds or maybe thousands of easy configs. So, yeah, and it, this could be a stepwise thing as well. You can only do it for the ones we include, then make it possible to scan an external repository, build a cache file for that, and and just see what happens. I mean, like, Elmo does things with the cache that we'll, we will probably also have to do. It has an auto-expire uh, setting that you can tweak, like how, when is a cache file considered to be stale? Uh, yeah, you have to be careful in updating the cache because it, it has to be automatic. Um, Atomic, pretty much. So, you, yeah, not that trivial. Any more questions? Okay, if there's none for now, um, I guess we can get set up. John gives you an extra ten or fifteen minutes.